a good afternoon to you all. On behalf of ICTS and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium, uh, I extend a very warm welcome to you to this edition of uh, Copy with Curiosity program. Uh, I take this opportunity to extend a hearty welcome to the speaker, Professor Sanjukta Roy. Um, and the topic that she has lined up is extremely interesting. After all, she is talking about uh, novel phases of matter at uh, close to absolute zero. As you would know, science and scientific laws become extremely interesting at uh, the extremes, whether the extremes of temperatures or extremes of pressures. Science is always interesting. It's uh, something out of the normal. So we expect an out of the normal talk uh, from Professor Sanjukta Roy. Uh, so we extend a, a very warm welcome to you. And I request uh, Professor Joseph uh, Samuel of ICTS to introduce a speaker to the audience. So welcome all of you. Yeah. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this uh, event that Sanjukta Rai is going to talk about. Uh, before I start on the introduction, I'd like to say a few words about this event and about ICTS and our activities in general. So the ICTS is located about 45 minutes from here, 45 minutes drive from here. And we have a joint interest along with the planetarium in promoting science in the public eye. And that's what this forum is about. So the ICTS has actually a three-pronged attack on science. We have meetings international discussion meetings that explore the frontiers of research. So that's the, apart from that, there's also internationally competitive research going on at ICTS. And finally, there's the outreach program of which this is an example. So we have programs at this at all levels, through all levels, school and college included. And the idea of outreach is to take the excitement of science and some of the substance to the general public. I hope you will get interested in science and also perhaps transmit this enthusiasm to your friends and your families. Now coming to the subject of today's talk, you're all familiar with three states of matter. So in this bottle, for example, you can see a liquid, a gas, and a solid. The bottle itself is solid. These are the familiar states of matter that you've all come to know and love. But when you heat atoms to a very high temperature, you get a fourth state of matter, which is plasma which is found in the sun, for example, at very high temperatures. When you do the opposite, when you cool atoms to a very low temperature, you get a fifth state of matter. And this is the Bose-Einstein condensate, the subject of today's talk. Now, Sanjukta is, uh, is the ideal person to tell us about this. She was part of the team that discovered the first Indian Bose-Einstein condensate in her PhD days in TIFR in Bombay. Since then, she has been in laboratories in France, in Paris, that is, and also in Italy, in Florence. And she's worked at the cutting edge of this subject, which is very, very interesting technologically as well as scientifically. Sanjukta is a very uh, enthusiastic researcher. She's very happy to share her research with anyone who will listen. So I welcome you all, and I welcome Sanjukta to, to give her talk right now. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for the lovely introduction. And I thank uh, ICTS and the organizers of Copy with Curiosity uh, and Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium for hosting this um, outreach lecture called Copy with Curios Curiosity. So here uh, today I'll be talking about uh, novel phases of matter near absolute zero temperature. Well, <clears throat> this is uh, a very um, interesting topic, uh, which is uh, also um, very interesting in the sense that here you can see uh, access very exotic phases of matter when you go to ultra low temperatures. Now, uh, here we um, in this talk, I will um, I invite you all to the exciting world of ultra cold quantum gases and share with you the excitement of doing science. In, in, in this very exciting regime. 
So the outline of my talk is, first I'll give you an introduction to Bose-Einstein condensate. Then I'll talk about how we realize Bose-Einstein condensate in our laboratory. And then I will talk about the exotic phases of matter um, via Bose-Einstein condensate, which researchers can access, which is superfluidity and supersolidity. And then I'll talk about the quantum technology applications we can have with ultra-cold atoms. <clears throat> and then I'll talk about the ultra-cold atom experiments at Raman Research Institute. So at the very outset, uh, a talk on Bose-Einstein condensation cannot begin without paying tribute to the two greatest minds, Satyendranath Bose and Albert Einstein. So they jointly collaborated to predict the exotic phenomena of Bose-Einstein condensation in 1924. Satyendranath Bose worked out the statistics for photons. Actually, there's a very interesting story which goes uh, with it. So in 1924, Satyendranath Bose was um, teaching at Dhaka University, which, which was part of India at the time. And during his teaching, he uh, realized that the, the contemporary theories were not actually explaining the experimental observations. So uh, what he realized that the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution cannot describe the microscopic particles, which uh, particles, and we cannot talk about a definite position and momentum for these microscopic particles. Because, uh, and what we can talk about is, that the position and momentum are within a range uh, the probability of having the position and momentum of the particle would be in a range, which is uh, a volume of phase space density, uh, phase space of H cube. And <clears throat> so this was actually a reverse, uh, a very um, revolutionary idea for from Bose and that he wrote up as, a artic as an article, which is Planck's which is Planck's law and hypothesis of light quanta. And he wrote up this article and sent it to Albert Einstein to uh, translate it to German and get it published in a German journal. So this is the letter, the, the historical letter by Satyendranath Bose, which he wrote to Einstein. So here he uh, described that uh, he has uh, used uh, the co so he has uh, deduced the coefficient of the Planck's law, h pi nu square by c cube, uh, independent of classical electrodynamics, only assuming that the elementary region of the space space has the volume of h cube. And he said that I don't know sufficient German to translate this paper in German and uh, get it published into a German journal. So I would, um, it would, I would be grateful if you can publish it in, in the journal, Zeitschrift for Physik. And in the end, he writes that I was the one who translated your paper on general relativity in English. So uh, this was probably uh, meant that uh, you, it will be nice if you return the favor. So Einstein on receiving this letter, he immediately realized the importance of this work and so he got this paper published in the name of Bose in 1924. And then he replied to the Bose saying that it's a beautiful step forward. Einstein recognized the importance of this work. And then he generalized this new statistics, which Bose had uh, discovered uh, to and applied it to particles with integer spin and predicted the phenomena of Bose-Einstein condensation. And hence, with this joint collaboration of two of the greatest minds, a new statistics, the Bose-Einstein statistics was born. So on June 4th, 19, uh, 2022, this year, uh, Google celebrated Satyendranath Bose with a Google Doodle. As you can see, this is the date which is uh, commemorating uh, the late letter of Satyendranath Bose to Einstein, which actually 
uh, it, it changed the history of science and led to the prediction of this exotic phenomena of post Einstein condensation. And Einstein immediately recognized this uh, discovery and uh, in quantum mechanics, and uh, it led to the, this, uh, the prediction of post Einstein condensation. So quantum particles, they are, uh, they can be categorized into two uh, different kinds. One is bosons, which have integer spins, and another is fermions. So in this talk, I'll be mostly concentrate on dating on bosonic particles, which have integer spins, and they, <clears throat> bosonic particles, they are, uh, they actually are very, um, uh, they can bunch together and they can all come together to the lowest quantum state to uh, form what is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Fermions, which have half integer spins, they are more of, uh, they maintain social distancing because they want to, uh, they obey the Pauli exclusion principle and each of the fermions, they occupy the, each uh, an individual quantum state and they fill up the quantum state one by one to the Fermi degenerate uh, to the Fermi energy to form what is called a Fermi degenerate gas. <clears throat> so, what is the prediction of Bose Einstein condensation? The prediction states that the lowest energy state can be occupied by a large number of particles well above the absolute zero temperature. When the temperature is very low, close to the absolute zero temperature, the bosonic particles, they all gather together to the lowest quantum state, even without the presence of any attractive interaction. And this phenomena is called Bose-Einstein condensation. So since all the particles are in the lowest quantum state, they are all in phase. And hence, we can say they are coherent. So let me explain the Bose-Einstein condensation. So at very high temperatures, the atoms are classical particles. They move like billiard balls. And as you lower the temperature, the de Broglie wavelength, which is inversely proportional to the square root of temperature, that becomes larger and larger. As the temperature reduces, the de Broglie wavelength becomes larger and larger, and the particles behave more and more like waves instead of classical particles. So at the critical temperature, you have the matter waves or the de Broglie wavelengths, they overlap with each other and you get what is called a Bose-Einstein condensation. Now, as we lower the temperature further, the, uh, the bosonic particles, they become a giant matter wave and they are all phase coherent. So, the phenomena of Bose-Einstein condensation will be clear from this video. Yeah. So here you can see that at high temperature, the classical particles are all moving like billiard balls. And as you're lowering the temperature, the atoms are getting slower because the velocities is actually proportional to the square root of temperature. So here, as you see that the temperature is lowered further and further, they, they stop behaving like ordinary classical particles, but they behave more like waves because their de Broglie wavelengths are increasing. And as you reach a very, very low temperatures, this de Broglie wavelengths are overlapping with each other and you get a giant matter wave called the Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is a very special temperature scale. It's a logarithmic temperature scale where you have the temperatures all the way from very high, like the surface of the sun or the stars, and then all the way to very low temperatures where we get the Bose-Einstein condensate. So here you can see that the, the freezing water, which is at zero degrees, it's here. And the liquid nitrogen, which is pretty cold, at 77 Kelvin, it's right here. And then we have superfluids like the superfluid helium at four Kelvin at this point in the temperature scale. And you have microwave background, which is uh, two Kelvin, the, the temperature of the interstellar space right here near three Kelvin temperature. And then 
we have the temperature at which we get the Bose-Einstein condensate right here at the bottom of the scale. And till now, the record temperature at which the Bose-Einstein condensate was achieved is around 38 picocalvin temperature. So which is very, very close to the absolute zero, which we can say it's the coldest matter in the universe. So we all knew about three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. But actually, as Sam had said, there are five states of matter. The fourth one being plasma, and the fifth one is the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is the fifth state of matter. Well, the plasma, the fourth state of matter, it is actually a superheated heated matter in which the electrons are ripped away from the atoms, and then you have an ionized gas where it's a soup of positively charged ions and negatively charged electrons. And this plasma you can see um, in various um, places in nature, like the lightning, uh, the beautiful northern lights, the sun's core, and also the nebula. Uh, also, you can have it um, produced in the laboratory where you can subject the gas to very strong electromagnetic field, like very high intensity laser pulses. You can have it uh, in a magnetic fusion reactor or in daily lives like, like the plasma TV or the neon light. Now, in the opposite extreme of the scale is the Bose-Einstein condensate, which occurs at really very, very low temperatures, at, as I had described in, your, in the previous slide. So how do we realize this exotic form of matter, Bose-Einstein condensate, in a laboratory? So we experimentalists have to know what is the experimental requirement for reaching the transition temperature to the Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is actually a magic number, uh, which is of the order of one, more precisely like 2.612, which is that the, uh, the product of the density, the atom number density, and cube of the de Broglie wavelength, which is actually given by this expression, uh, which is inversely proportional to the square root of temperature. So this product has to reach the value. Now, uh, for a typical atoms, uh, the dilute atomic gases, the de Broglie wavelength at which we reach the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature is around 300 nanometer, which um, transpires to a temperature typically around 300 nanokelvin and an atom number density of 10 to the power 14 atoms per centimeter cube. So uh, I won't go into the details of this uh, quite boring looking slide, but the main point I want to make is that going to a Bose-Einstein condensate, condensate is not a one-step process. It's involving several steps where at each step we are increasing the density, the atom number density, and also lowering the temperature to reach this magic number. So which involves laser cooling and trapping and loading to an optical dipole trap or magnetic trap, and finally of evaporative cooling to the Bose-Einstein condensate. So the first step is laser cooling and trapping. So as the word laser cooling, it's a bit confusing because um, generally we think of lasers as something which heats up things. Uh, you can even use laser to cut metals because uh, it, it's very, it can be very hot. But how do we use lasers to cool down atoms? Actually, the answer lies in, in something which we all know, like the comet, that we use radiation pressure of the laser to cool down atoms. So we are familiar with radiation pressure of light because in comets, you can see that the tail of the comet, which uh, consists mostly of dust, dust particles and other materials, it, it points away from the sun because of the radiation pressure of the sun. So we use this radiation pressure of the laser beams to actually cool down the atoms to around micro Kelvin temperatures. So what we use for this laser cooling is what's called a Doppler effect. So Doppler effect, we all know, 
it is that is when you go towards the electromagnetic radiation you find that the frequency of 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 the wave is increasing and we when we go away from the wave you find it decreasing so uh, for example if you are on a seashore and you go towards the coming incoming waves when you if you take a boat and go towards the wave you will see that the waves are coming faster but if you return back you will see that the waves are receding slower so this is the same way in which you can uh, you see that the radiation frequency is increasing if you go towards it and it becomes less if you go away from it so atoms are very special uh, it does not absorb a light unless the frequency is just right to excite an atomic transition from the ground state to the excited state so when the frequency of the radiation is just right the atom absorbs the photon and it gives an absorption signal which has the maximum at the transition frequency so the transition frequency is actually the difference of frequency between the ground state and the excited state now if the atom is moving towards the laser beam it sees the frequency upshifted and if it goes away from the laser beam it sees it downshifted so how do we use this for slowing down the atoms suppose we have a laser beam which is red detuned from the resonance that means the frequency is slightly tuned less than the atomic transition frequency now if the atom moving with velocity v is moving towards the laser beam it will see the laser beam frequency upshifted and hence it will see it on resonance and hence it will absorb a photon now this photon it will give a momentum kick opposite to its direction of motion so hence the velocity of the atom will get slowed down now as soon as the atom absorbs the photon this is spontaneous emission which uh, which happens because it it emits in uh, all and uh, all direction so in the spontaneous emission uh, it happens in random direction so each step due, because of the absorption it gets a momentum kick which slows down the atom but the spontaneous emission happens in random direction so the average effect is averages out to be the uh, average effect of the spontaneous emission turns out to be zero so the only effect which remains is the atoms get slowed down because of the laser beam so here you can see a very nice interplay between the internal and the external degrees of freedom which leads to the cooling of the atoms now what happens is if you have two laser beams from both direction so you see that the force is opposite to the velocity that means uh, whichever direction the atom is moving the force is um, the light force is acting so that it slows down the atom so this force you see is linearly proportional to the velocity at the center that means it's like a frictional force that means it it it's like a damping force which slows down the atom so now what happens if you have this laser beams from all six directions so you form what is called a optical molasses which actually slows down the atom in all three directions now this is just slowing down of atoms so how do we trap the atoms so that we can put it in a place and observe the atoms in uh, without any motion so for uh, for the trapping what we do is we have a position dependent force that means we have a magnetic field which produces which is zero at the center and it increases linearly in all directions so that means uh, when the atom moves away from the center it feels a greater force than when it is at the center so it's like a spring that means the farther you stretch the spring the larger force you feel which pushes it pushes it towards the center so it's like a spring force which is actually causing the trapping of the atoms so this is the configuration of the magnet optical trapping where we have both cooling of the atoms as well as trapping so this is the configuration of the magnet optical trap where we have atoms at micro kelvin temperatures which is like million times less than your room temperature and also you can see the cold atoms right here inside the vacuum chamber now here the special thing is that 
it reduces the velocity of the atoms at room temperature, which is actually 330,000 um, centimeters per second to all the way to 10 centimeters per second. That means the atoms are really, really slowed down. So here you can see a cloud of atoms, which is trapped inside the vacuum chamber. And here we need to put the atoms at very, very low pressure because you don't want the hot atoms to collide with the cold atoms and knock it out of the trap. So here the vacuum, the pressure is around 100 billion times less than the atmospheric pressure. For this um, discovery of this nice method of laser cooling and trapping, Stephen Chu, Claude Cohen-Penauci and William Phillips uh, had received the Nobel Prize in 1997. Now you must be thinking that how do we actually measure the temperature? We cannot put a, an auditory thermometer inside the vacuum chamber. So what we do is measure the temperature using something called a time of flight. That means we release the trap and let the atoms fall. So as the atoms fall, it expands because of its velocity. So larger the velocity or larger the temperature, larger will be the ball or the cloud of atoms. And then if you see the signal on the detector, it will be the larger the temperature, the la larger will be the width of, of, the, of the signal. So from this, we can measure the temperature. Now, and how do we actually detect the atoms? So we use the at, uh, use a detection method called absorption imaging where we uh, have the light shine on the atoms and we see the shadow of, of the atomic cloud on a CCD camera. And here you can see this dark spot. This happens because atoms are absorbing the light. And so it is the reduction of light because of the absorption of the atoms. And this is giving an image in which we can see the cold atoms. <clears throat> Now, uh, there's a limitation by which um, a limitation to which we can reduce the temperature using this method, because even a absorption of a single photon can heat up the atom. Now we want a trap which is dark. That means there is no photon which is scattered by the atom. So we use something called uh, dark traps, which is either a dipole trap or a magnetic trap. So uh, in a First, I'll explain the dipole trap, which is also called optical tweezer. Now, a tweezer is, you know, a tweezer, if you want to pick up something small, you use a tweezer. So we use a tweezer made up of laser beams to actually pick up the cold atoms or, or trap the cold atoms. So if we focus this laser beam, it, it makes a, a, a trap where we can actually fill up the cold atoms. So this uh, higher the intensity, more will be the depth of this trap where we can fill up the atoms. Another way uh, to actually trap the atoms is magnetic trap. Uh, so here you can see uh, that this is the, these are the atoms which are trapped in this optical tweezers. It's actually a crossed optical tweezer where the atoms are trapped and the atoms from the magnet optical trap which are not trapped, they are, are just falling down due to gravity. So there's another way in which you can trap, which is called magnetic trap. That means you have a magnetic field and atoms having spins, they can actually get trapped in this uh, due to the magnetic field of this magnetic trap. So there's this interesting video which explains how um, atoms get trapped in the magnetic trap. So here you can imagine this small magnet which is spinning it's, it's like the atoms which has a spin and because of this magnetic field, it, it gets actually levitated. So in the same way, we actually levitate the atoms which has a spin in the magnetic trap. Uh, because the atoms are inside a vacuum chamber, we cannot touch uh, the atoms with anything, uh, anything which is matter because then the atoms uh, temperature will, it will get, uh, get hotter because of the uh, in contact with, with any material object. So we need an invisible uh, you know, force which actually traps the atom. So we do that with optical tweezers or this magnetic trap. Now, how do we cool down the atoms further? So what we do is we slowly reduce the trap depth. That means the higher energy atoms, which are 
in the periphery of the trap, they go out of the trap and the remaining atoms, they collide and among themselves and uh, the overall temperature reduces. And finally, as the temperature reduces, we reach what is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. So it's like cooling your coffee cup where the higher energy or the hotter molecules are just evaporating out of the trap and the remaining atoms uh, they, or remaining molecules, they collide and then your coffee gets cooled down. So in this way, we can go to the Bose-Einstein condensate. So how do we know that we have got the Bose-Einstein condensate? Now, the signature of a Bose-Einstein condensate is that you have a very high density portion which comes at the center of, of this image of the absorption image which uh, and uh, in the background of very low density atoms so if you plot the density profile of this cloud you'll see a very sharp peak at the center which is actually a signature of a bose einstein condensate which is the 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 a giant matter wave which is a coherent matter wave So here you can see that before we reach the BC phase transition, we have a very low density cloud of atoms, which has a very broad density profile. But as you reach the Bose-Einstein condensation transition temperature, you have a very dense peak, dense uh, portion, uh, dense uh, portion at the center, which is actually a sharp peak in the density profile. So you have a Bose-Einstein condensate coexisting with a very broad density profile of the thermal gas. And as you lower the temperature further, you get what is called a pure Bose-Einstein condensate. So here you can see the video where it's a 3D density profile of uh, the formation of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So I play it once more, you see a thermal gas and suddenly there's a peak which is appearing at the center, which is a smoking gun evidence for formation of a Bose-Einstein condensate. So for realize, realizing the first Bose-Einstein condensate in dilute gases, uh, Carl Weimann, Eric Connell and Wolfgang Ketteli, uh, they received the Nobel Prize in uh, 2001. So in a Bose-Einstein condensate, all the atoms are moving in, in currently, that means in locksteps. So you must have seen uh, during the Republic Day that the soldiers are marching in locksteps. They, their steps are all matching with each other. So in the same way, the atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate, they march in lockstep. That means they are coherent. They are all in phase. So that is the, the beauty of this exotic uh, form of matter. So this is the um, images of uh, the formation of Bose-Einstein condensate in our experiment at uh, TFR Mumbai. So here you can see a thermal cloud, and then we see a sharp uh, peak appearing at the center, which is a dense um, center. Um, which is the uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. And there at very low temperature of 140 nanokelvin, you get almost a pure Bose-Einstein condensate. So this, uh, we had a three member team for the BEC, which is um, comprising of uh, uh, Saptrishi, me and our supervisor CS Unni Krishnan. So this is our experimental setup and in TIFR. And we have the BC, which was produced here. Now, uh, this setup looks a bit scary, but uh, I can uh, assure you that each of, of the elements are extremely important to the experiment. So if you take out one, the experiment won't just uh, work. And here uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, there are several components of this experiment. Now you can make each of the components work work fine individually, but the Bose-Einstein condensation can occur only when all the parts of the experiments, they work extremely uh, perfectly uh, together. So this is the challenge of the experiment that we need to have all the parts of the experiment working together perfectly at the same time to get what is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. 
So our post Einstein condensate in TFR was a humble tribute to the uh, to the great mind uh, Satyendranath Bose. So here you can see the phase transition of Bose Einstein condensate. So at very uh, higher temperature, before we reach the critical temperature, the Bose Einstein, there's only thermal atoms, but as we reach the critical temperature, you can see a sharp increase of atoms in the Bose Einstein condensate state. So this is another setup which I had built almost from the beginning in Florence. So this is a potassium Bose Einstein condensate. So here you can see a typical uh, cycle of the experiment where we load the atoms, we do laser cooling and trapping, load the atoms in a magnetic trap, transfer it to the main, which is called a science cell, and then we produce the Bose Einstein condensate here in the science cell. <clears throat> So here we had got a very large Bose-Einstein condensate of potassium atoms, which we got in a, a reasonably short time of 3.5 seconds. So what is the speciality of this coherent state of matter? Now it is analogous to laser beams, which is emitting coherent laser light. So in, in a laser, the, all the waves which are coming out of the laser are coherent. And so if you interfere two laser beams, you, what you get is an interference pattern. But on the other hand, if you see, take an ordinary, maybe an LED light, the light which is coming out are incoherent. So, you, you, uh, so it is very different from a coherent laser light. So in the same way, when you have a thermal um, cloud of atoms, which is not in the Bose-Einstein condensate, state, it is incoherent. And when you have atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate, they are all a giant coherent matter wave. Now, this, the evidence for a coherent matter wave is what is called interference. So if you have uh, uh, two, um, a Bose-Einstein condensate, if you split up into two and then you combine it, what you find is an interference pattern. So this is an evidence that the atoms in the Bose-Einstein condensate are all phase coherent. That's why you can see a nice interference pattern when you, you, uh, you split the Bose-Einstein condensate and then combine it, to, it together. So now I come uh, to the next part of uh, the talk, which is I'll describe what is another exotic form of matter, which is the superfluid. Now, suppose you stir a coffee cup and uh, you go out of the room and then you come back and you still find that your coffee cup is still getting stirred. And not only that, you find that the, 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 the fluid in the cup is actually seeping through the bottom and it's coming out and creeping out and flowing out from the cup. So it's, it sounds like a scene from a horror movie, but it, it's, it's possible if your fluid is a superfluid. That means a fluid with zero viscosity. So it is analogous to superconductors where electric current flows without resistance below a critical temperature. So here you can see the superfluid transition as the liquid helium is and lower temperature and you see that after a certain temperature i mean lower than a certain temperature it undergoes a phase transition to the superfluid and it loses all the viscosity and and it, it flows uh, without friction so here you can see the transition to the superfluid which is again a very coherent state of matter so as the atoms are going in the superfluid state, you can see that it becomes, uh, the viscosity is, is, is almost zero. So it seeps through the bottom of, of, of the porous cup. And not only that, it, it can creep out from the sides and it can fall because there's no viscosity at all in, in the superfluid state. So also it can, it can make a, a fountain which, is, which can go up and it can go on forever because the superfluid, it can flow without resistance. 
So for the discovery of superfluidity, uh, which, was, uh, which was first observed in 1937 by John uh, Meisner, John Allen, and Pierre uh, Kapitsa. So the Nobel Prize of, in Physics was awarded in 1978 to Kapitsa for discovering the superfluid phase. Now, what is so special about the superfluid state? Now, if you have in a bucket a normal fluid and you rotate the bucket, so you just find there's a meniscus which is forming. Now, if you have a superfluid in the bucket and you rotate it, you will see that there are vortices which are forming in the bucket. So this formation of the vortices is actually evidence for superfluidity. So why these vortices are formed? So here you can see that uh, a superfluid, as, as I said, it's a, it's a coherent matter wave. So it's, it's like a giant matter wave. So a wave, if you rotate it, it should close up on itself. That means it should end up where it started. Now, if you rotate a rigid body, the velocity, uh, which will uh, at the center and at the, at the periphery, it will uh, increase linearly. But for a superfluid, it cannot, it cannot take, uh, you know, the continuous uh, velocity, but it should take velocities only in steps. So this is the um, reason why you see what is Ah, now it's working. Okay. So the no lowest energy state is that it forms an array of vortices inside the superfluid. So in the same way, a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a coherent matter wave, can also be thought of as a superfluid, which when you rotate, you see that there's an array of vortices, which is an evidence that Bose-Einstein condensate is also a superfluid state of matter. So now I come to uh, another very exotic uh, state, which is called a super solid phase, which uh, you can get when you uh, have a Bose-Einstein condensate in, in a special experimental configuration. So super solidity in Bose-Einstein condensate is the coexistence of solid, superfluid, and gas at the same time. So it's, a, it's actually a paradoxical quantum fluid where we can have a frictionless flow of a superfluid and the crystalline order of a solid. So this is similar to uh, the, the Roman god, uh, the Roman god Gyanus, uh, where uh, it has two contrasting nature. So one phase is looking towards the past and another is looking towards the future. So you can have a crystalline phase and also a superfluid phase at the same time in the same matter co coexisting, which is called the super solid state of matter. Now, uh, in, in a liquid and a gas, you have what is called a continuous translational symmetry. That means whichever point you look in the liquid or a gas, you find that it's, it's all symmetric. But in a solid state, what you have is breaking of a continuous translation symmetry. That means you have a crystalline structure. That means when you translate, it's not the same at all points in space. So this is actually a, 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 a characteristic of the solid state. Now, in super solid, um, uh, so how do you get a super solid using a, a quantum state of matter or a Bose-Einstein condensate? So what we do is uh, we take, uh, I mean, a, a, a very highly polar molecule. That means with a large dipole moment, it's it's taken, uh, it's evaporatively cooled to uh, the BC transition temperature. And what you uh, find is that as it's cooled evaporatively, it's actually uh, getting arranged in, um, in a crystalline form. And each of these crystalline forms are actually um, 
current, I mean, they're called quantum droplets because in each of each of the uh, part or each of the droplets are superfluid. That means they are coherent. So the evidence for the coherence of each of these quantum droplets is that when you release them and interfere, you see an interference pattern, which is actually the evidence for phase coherence. So here you can see in this video that as the dipolar molecules are evaporatively cooled, you can see a super solid which is formed, which is a crystalline form of matter. But uh, note that each of this, what is called a quantum droplet, they are superfluid and phase coherent. And if you interfere them, you get an interference pattern. So this is a very exotic state of matter where you have the crystalline form as well as the superfluidity existing at the same time. So now I come to the next part of the talk, which is quantum technology with cold atoms. So this is actually um, uh, the practical applications or, or the applications towards, uh, towards using quantum mechanics towards um, development of new technology using ultra cold atoms. So recently in 2020, we have in NASA, they actually produced the Bose-Einstein condensate in space. So it was a, a huge progress in, in, this, uh, in this field of research because with BC in space, you can do what is called a gravimetry, a very precise gravimetry where uh, because of the of, uh, very cold temperatures of the Bose-Einstein condensate, you can very precisely uh, measure the gravitational field of the earth. And since it's in space, you don't have any geographical barrier and you can uh, measure a lot of very important things uh, in Earth. For example, you can uh, look at the temporal change of the Earth's gravitational field. You can uh, look at the physics uh, of the Earth's interior. You can look at the circulation of the oceans. And also you can uh, measure the densities of the water and ice very accurately and you can predict the climate change, which is very important. Uh, now I come to another very important applications of cold atoms, which is the atomic clocks. So in olden times, uh, people used to look at, uh, I mean, measure time by Earth's rotation. And uh, then there were pendulum clocks where the oscillation of the pendulum actually gave the time. And in modern times, we use what is called a quartz watch, where the, the oscillation of the quartz crystal is give, um, gives the time, which is actually uh, accurate, which uh, for very, uh, very um, good quartz watch, you can have uh, uh, an accuracy of 30 seconds per year. That means you lose only 30 seconds in one full year. So, but atomic clocks is, uh, is a very important um, development in this field where you can increase the accuracy of the clock by a million on odd million orders of magnitude. So the first atomic clock, which was installed in NIST in 1952, uh, here it, it had a accuracy of 30 seconds in 1 million years. So you can imagine the big increase in accuracy by shifting to an atomic clock. Also, you can have a fountain atomic clock with cold atoms where the atoms are actually launched up uh, and then it falls down and the atoms are interrogated. Uh, the atoms are as cold at, as 10 centimeters per second and it gives a very precise time uh, with the fountain atomic clock. So it's called a fountain atomic clock because the atoms are actually launched up like a fountain and it goes through a microwave cavity where it is subjected to a microwave field and it goes up and then it again comes down through the cavity where it's again uh, subjected to the microwave field. And then it is measured, the state of the atom is measured using a laser beam. So here you can see that uh, uh, as the microwave, the frequency of the microwave field is um, changed, you see a maxima of, of the uh, absorption of the atom. So this, this actually defines the second. That means you can, uh, it's, it's actually gives the definition of the seconds, which is uh, the duration of 
uh, of this number of periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the cesium atoms. So cold atoms are actually very useful for making a very precise atomic clock. Now, uh, so how precise is this atomic clock? So for the fountain atomic clock, the, uh, the accuracy is that it will lose just one second in 300 million years. So also you can have a more precise atomic clocks using optical lattice uh, clock, where you have an uncertainty of two into 10 to the power minus 18. Also you can have iron clock where you can have uh, a, a lot more accuracy where you lose just one second in 14 billion years. So you may wonder that where do we actually need so much accuracy um, for um, using the atomic clocks? So you certainly not use uh, this accuracy in your daily life, but, uh, but certainly you use it for, our G for the GPS, which you use uh, all the time for, um, for getting your position. Uh, on the road. So here, uh, how does the G GPS work? So um, it works when you have uh, the satellites, which is which has the onboard atomic clocks. And uh, so when you have uh, the satellites, they trans they broadcast the time, and when it reaches um, the reaches the position of of uh, of the person, so it broadcasts the time, and the GPS receiver in in the in the device it uh, it it gets the um, the position of the uh, position of the device by taking uh, taking into account the three D position uh, from the information of the time broadcasted by all the three or the four satellites. So for the invention of the atomic uh, of clocks and also the iron traps, uh, Ramsey, Demelt, and Wolfgang Paul received the Nobel Prize in 1989. Now I come to another a very important part of the talk, which is the quantum simulator. So quantum simulator is, it works um, on the idea of Richard Feynman, where one controllable quantum uh, system can simulate another. So uh, to quantum simulate, um, uh, for quantum simulation, we're using ultra cold atoms. We build what is called an optical lattice. That means we have two laser beams, which are retro reflected and we get an interference pattern, which is the standing wave. And we can, when we load the atoms into this optical lattice, we can have the atoms in, in the antidotes of this optical lattice. That means, uh, for example, like, eggs in an egg crate. So the quantum uh, gases in optical lattice, it actually emulates electrons in a solid state lattice. So that means you can have a quantum simulation of, uh, um, of uh, quantum simulation of solid state systems using quantum gases in optical lattice. So uh, quantum gases in optical lattice is a very controllable system where we can control all the parameters right from the dimension to the lattice geometry uh, to the in interaction between the atoms uh, where uh, so we can also explore a lot of parameter range which is normally not achievable in in in, uh, in uh, normal materials so also we there's a possibility that we can explore new physics so in optical lattice, we can have different kinds of configuration of the lattice beams, and we can make designer lattices where we can trap the atoms. So here we can, uh, you know, um, have the atoms in different configuration to simulate different kinds of, uh, of physics in, in solid state systems. For example, if you have a 1D lattice, you can have uh, an array of pancake shape shaped cloud where you can go to two dimensional geometry in each of the pancakes. If you have a 2D lattice, you can have an array of rod shaped um, atomic clouds where you can have explore 1D uh, physics. And you can also uh, have a 3D optical lattice where you can actually trap uh, the atoms in each point uh, in space uh, in the 3D optical lattice. So why this, uh, um, the quantum simulation is, is so important. 
because it can give uh, rise. So if you have atoms um, arranged to different kinds of configuration in an optical lattice, it's like atomic Legos. With a few Legos, you can build a, a wide range of, uh, of shapes. So in the same way, if you have atoms uh, trapped in the optical lattice in different kinds of configuration, you can uh, build up a, a, a wide range of configuration where you can explore uh, open questions, uh, for example, the quantum nature of magnetism or even high temperature superconductivity. Uh, we can answer the questions that is it possible to make a material which is superconducting at room temperature as well as an atmospheric pressure. So we can use this uh, very controllable geometry, very controllable system of ultra cold atoms in optical lattice to have atoms in various kind of configuration uh, so that we can simulate the physics in, in, in various kinds of materials. So the advantage of this kind of system is that for uh, making a different kind of configuration, we just have to change the parameters in our experiment uh, as contrast to uh, materials where you have to each time grow a new sample to have a new property of the material. But here we can just change the parameters in our experiment to simulate a new kind of material or, or a different configuration, which can help us to explore the physics in, 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 uh, in the existing material, as well as search for a new kind of material. So um, I come to the last part of my talk, where, um, uh, where I will explain that, uh, explain the quantum mixtures uh, experiment, as well as the Rydberg experiment, which we have in Raman Research Institute. So here uh, in, the, in RRI, we have a quantum mixture experiment where we have experiment not only on Bose-Einstein condensate, but also we will have uh, fermions. That means we will uh, study the interaction between bosons as well as fermions in our experiment. So why Bose-Fermi mixture? Well, Bose-Fermi mixture is very important in, in various uh, aspects or various uh, uh, kinds of, of uh, physical system. For example, uh, the quarks in a proton, they exchange gluons, which is a boson, to uh, via the strong force. Also in a superconductor, the, the Cooper pairing is formed between the electrons, which are fermions, and the interaction is mediated via the phonon, which is a boson. Also, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lattice, the electrons are addressed by the lattice vibra vibrations, which are phonons, to form what is called a polaron. So you can see the Bose-Fermi interaction is so important in a wide variety of physical systems. <clears throat> So this is a versatile quantum many body system where it's governed by interplay of quantum statistics, uh, interparticle interaction, and the relative number of bosons and the fermionic components. So here is uh, the design of our experimental system. So we will, we have on one side, uh, the cold atom uh, for the potassium, which will be the fermionic um, component. And here we have the sodium, uh, part where which will be the bosonic component and we uh, have the cold atomic beam of the potassium and sodium which are mixed together in this uh, vacuum chamber and then the mixture the mixed cold atomic mixture will be transported to the science cell where we will do the quantum simulation using a quantum mixtures of bosons and fermions so this is actually the uh, the real picture of the experimental setup where we have the cold atomic uh, cloud of sodium and potassium. So here you can see inside the vacuum chamber, the, the cold atomic cloud of potassium. And here you have the cold uh, sodium atomic cloud. So this is a picture of, of our experiment when we are actually trapping the cold atoms. So here you see the bright yellow light, which is used for trapping the sodium atoms. And uh, for the potassium atoms, the, light, the cooling light is an infrared, so it's not visible uh, in this picture. 
So the, another experiment what we are doing at RRI is on Rydberg atoms. So Rydberg atoms are actually giant atoms or super atoms where the electrons are excited to very, very high electronic state. So as a result, the size becomes very large of the order of, of the size of, of a human hair or, 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 or a micron as compared to atoms at the ground state, which are like uh, size of an angstrom. So why this atom is so special? Because when you have atoms so giant, you have a very strong interaction between the atoms. So this is the um, photograph of the Rydberg uh, atom experiment. So um, in the, when the atoms are in the Rydberg state, they are very, very strongly interacting. That means if you have uh, the atoms, the Rydberg atoms arranged in an array of optical tweezers, you can use the very strong interaction between the Rydberg atoms to create entanglement or atomic qu qubits for quantum computing. So uh, this is uh, one very important aspect of quantum technology. Also, you can use this Rydberg atoms to um, do a quantum simulation of magnetism or, or quantum behavior of magnetism, where you can have uh, that Rydberg atoms, the interaction between the Rydberg atoms, enabling it to be arranged in an, for example, antiferromagnetic on ordering. And we can understand the quantum behavior of, of magnetic atoms. Also, you can, uh, the Rydberg atoms, when they are at very, very high uh, electronic state, they are extremely sensitive to electric fields. That means they can sense a very, very small electric field. So we can use Rydberg atoms as extremely accurate sensor for electric fields. And we can, uh, we can hope to actually uh, overcome, the, overcome the, the standard quantum limit uh, using, um, and we can use quantum tricks such as qui state to reach what is called the Heisenberg limit, which is the holy grail of precision, uh, grail of precision measurements. So here, uh, as uh, you can see, the Rydberg atoms are extremely versatile atoms, which can use, which can be used in in in, in, a, in a variety of uh, applications on quantum technology. So this is our group um, at RRI in the both the quantum mixtures as well as the Rydberg experiment. So I come to the end of the talk. So uh, let me give you a summary. So I first explained the Bose-Einstein condensate. I gave an introduction to the exotic phenomena. Then I uh, also explained how we actually realize Bose-Einstein condensate in the laboratory. Then I explained some uh, exotic phases of matter which we get when we go to temperatures near absolute zero, which is super solid, super fluidity and super solidity, where we have super fluidity and the crystalline order existing at the same time. Then I talked also about atomic clocks, which can uh, do a time keeping to extremely high accuracy, which is actually used in practical applications, for example, in satellite navigation and our GPS, which we use in our daily life. Uh, also, uh, um, finally, I also um, uh, explained uh, the, the experiment on Rydberg atoms, which is also uh, has a very um, important applications for quantum technology, such as quantum sensing and also quantum computing. Uh, and I also gave a glimpse of our experiment uh, at RRI. So you are all um, welcome to come and visit our labs in RRI and see the, uh, see the cold atoms live. And we'll be happy to welcome you in our, life, in our lab. So that's, uh, I come to the end of the talk. Thanks for your kind attention. Hello, yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask the speaker now. In one of your slides where you had the curve, where uh, the you, you had a 1.0 on the left-hand side on the axis, the critical temperature or what, what has been reached 
in that level of one so far in the world? Um, uh, yeah, you had a curve uh, all the, the way B down. The and BC then, uh, phase yes, transition. Yes, and, uh, and then you said uh, normally we, we are at very low values. You go back further. Just curious to know what level we have reached. Further down. Ha, this one. Uh, yeah, so this so, is actually the fraction correct. of the bosine strain correct. condensate. So, uh, to what level have we gone up to one? Have we reached 0.99 or 0 0.9 or what is? Well, uh, people have gone very, very close ha. to one. So uh, it's like, uh, I think people have gone to 0 0.95 or so. Uh, but uh, you always have some thermal yeah. atoms, yeah. which uh, makes it so not reaching exactly. 0.95. Something like that, oh. yes. So uh, this is what uh, you get in, in a normal, you know, you cannot go to absolute I, yeah. t equal to zero where you definitely get a one. Yes. But, uh, you know, near about absolute zero, you get to very close to one. But the, the lowest temperature she mentioned was Pico. No, yeah, it was 30th Pico, yes. Pico Kelvin. In terms of statistics of both, what value, value we have come to, yeah. Maybe it will improve over time, but today, what is the record? I just wanted to know. It's very close yes. to one. It's, around. Ah, it's yeah. very, very yeah, close yeah, to yeah, one. It will be, yes. yes. This Rydberg atoms and cold atoms, what is yeah. the connection? Uh, so we can, um, actually, we what we do is experiments on cold Rydberg atoms. Yes. So Rydberg atoms, when they are hot, they're moving at such high velocities. You cannot actually have enough time to observe them or, or to do experiments on them. So we want to do uh, exp meaningful experiments on, 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 on quantum technology with Rydberg atoms. So we want to have it at, uh, trapped in a point in space and also cold. So that, we, uh, for example, I showed you in one of the slides uh, where we- um, Yeah, you have the quantum entanglement. Yeah, so where we actually trap them in, in, in the array of optical tweezers, and so you, unless you trap them, you cannot have those atoms close enough. How, how do you, uh, without so how trapping- How practically achieved that huh? electrons are boosted to very high levels yeah. to get Rydberg atoms? Exactly. And where does the cold atom come into picture to get this quantum entanglement? So you cannot have the atoms trapped in this optical tweezers mm -hmm. unless you are cold. If you have very, very high temperatures, so these, optical tweezers, they have a trap depth. So if the atoms are very hot, much larger, with the energy much larger than the trap depth of these optical tweezers, you cannot trap it in those optical tweezers. So you have to cool them to actually trap them in individual optical tweezers. So that is how if you have trapped and cold atoms, then you can control them very nicely. So when you have Why atoms are cold. Huh? This, uh, so we are building an up, up the experiment. So we are about to, I mean, we are about to reach that stage where we are, we have the experimental design such that we can make this optical tweezers. We have the lasers. Mm -hmm. So it's the next step in the experiment. We already have cold atoms. So this, we are going to trap it in the optical tweezers and excite to the Rydberg atoms. There's a question from, excuse me. Yes, the material used for this, uh, what is that called? Sorry, it's, I'm uh, hearing new. Uh, what is that word just now? Where you trap it? Optical tweezers. Uh, what is the material used to make it? So optical tweezers are using laser light. Uh -huh. So in our lab, we will be using uh, a laser having wavelength 852 nanometer. Uh, so which is like in a infrared. Uh, so this lasers, we are going to actually focus it. Uh, we, we are going to make individual focused laser beams. And that is actually going to trap single atoms, which we are going to excite to the Rydberg state. And then we will go into do experiments on quantum entanglement. Okay, okay there was a question from here. Yes. Uh, the Rydberg atoms, when they're cooled down, does the size decrease, atomic size? Uh, no, uh, the Rydberg atoms, when they are excited, I and mean, the size is determined by which electronic state you are exciting to. So when you're cold, uh, co uh, cooling it down, it just is confined to a point in space. So uh, the characteristic of the Rydberg atom, it remains the same. It's just that it's not 
moving so fast it's just uh, confined to points in space thank you yeah as i have shown it's like eggs in the egg crate so they are actually confined very nicely in in like eggs in the egg crate so that's a two dimensional structure so here we'll be starting with a one dimensional array of uh, of tweezers yes yeah, excuse me what is mean by pure bec and giant wave nature uh so a pure bc is that where all the atoms Means we don't see wave we only see wave nature of particle yeah not particle uh, not particle nature only wave nature we see at bc well i mean that's the speciality of bc that see particles we see in our in room temperatures for example here in the room uh, you have molecules uh, moving at 300 meters per second so but Uh, in the bc which is extremely cold there you have the de broglie wavelength of the bc which is very large that means it it has more of a wave nature that means if you as i had shown if you interfere the bc you will get an interference pattern that means the atoms in the bc are co are coherent <coughs> are coherent that means uh, they are all having the same phase or a definite phase relationship with each other so we can't see particle nature means uh, the experiment of particle nature well i mean they are particles i mean the, the fact that you can see the image of the atoms that means they are particles that's why you are seeing the atoms right but uh, i mean when we see the image that means each of the atoms is absorbing absorbing the photon and giving us the absorption the signal for the absorption so that is its particle nature but we see the wave nature when we go to a superfluid state that means you rotate the bc and you see vortices that means is coherent when you split the bc and interfere you see the interference pattern that is the wave nature of the bc yeah, yeah the gentleman at the okay okay um hello ma'am uh, so i have some few questions uh like uh, in one slide you showed one criteria right like in lambda db cube yes that that. yes so that uh, lambda db was uh, uh, inversely proportional to square root of mass right square root of temperature i mean uh, uh i yes. so like my question was uh, in the talk like uh, we saw that bc is generally with uh, rubidium atoms and potassium atoms so yeah. like uh, why not with low mass atoms wouldn't that criteria be much easily met um Yeah, uh, yeah, ah, yeah. Here. Yeah, that lambda dv, that mass is uh, uh, like inversely proportional, right? So if you have lower yes. mass atoms, wouldn't it be easier to uh, be greater than that criteria? Yes. Okay. So that's why cold atom researchers have used many kinds of atoms, also lithium atoms, which are really, really light. So uh, we have, I mean, the researchers have made BC also with lithium atoms, which are extremely light. as well as cesium atoms dysprosium atoms so there's like really wide range of atoms so light atoms the, there are some disadvantages that they are too light so it's very difficult to you need a lot of uh, you know uh, laser power to trap them because they are so light on the other hand for example cesium cesium is very heavy atom and that's why because of some advantages cesium atom is used as the atomic frequency trans uh, standard that means is it's used as the definition of second for an atomic clock so the transition between the cesium atoms so every atom has an advantage which is used for different experiments to take advantage of the special characteristic of that particular atom okay uh, ma'am one more question is uh, that uh, yeah, mostly is alkali uh, atoms uh, yeah. but uh, like i i'm not sure if it's correct or not but alkali atoms is like one unpaired electron right so like uh, are they bosons yeah they are bosons so how do you decide an atom is boson or fermions so it's the overall um, the spin so as i said um, the zero integer spins are bosons and half integer spins are fermions now electrons and protons are same in number so what is deciding the spin is the neutron so if you have odd number of neutrons it's like fermion if you have even number of neutrons it's bosons okay there was a question at the back there yes please so uh, in one of uh, you said that the if you pass uh, we can reduce the speed of atoms if you pass through a cold substrate 
atoms to a cold uh, or reduce the temperature of atoms we can reduce the speed yeah. similar things can happen with the photon as well like can we reduce the speed of photon in a certain manner through some experimental setup so that yeah it's a good question so you can actually slow down light with what is called an electromagnetically induced transparency so um, when you have uh, this special effect which is a quantum interference effect where you have a three level system so you have uh, two kind of two transitions now uh, there is a there can be destructive quantum interference between these two transitions and that can completely uh, cancel the absorption so in this kind of system you have a very sharp change of the refractive index hmm, at the point where you have the cancellation of absorption so this sharp change of this refractive index it actually uh, can be used to slow down the atoms because you know as the refractive index is poor you the atoms i mean the photons can be slowed down inside the medium so it's something called a polariton where you can have the atoms uh, sorry the photons entering a medium then you have this electromagnetically induced transparency and then the atoms can slow down and get even trapped now if you remove that uh, that effect then the photon can again go out of the med of the medium so it's called a uh, uh, slowing of light using this uh, polaritons are there any, any more questions you sure you want to ask something okay so if there are no further questions so thank you all for coming i'm sorry yes i have one question so uh, so why can't we continue laser cooling it uh, till the bc is achieved uh, what's the limiting factor that you need to have another method to cool it further yeah so as i said uh so there is something which is called a single photon recoil limit which i'll come to it in a while yes so this limit is because the heating effect if you absorb and scatter a photon so this absorbing and scattering of photon it actually heats up an atom as much as 0.4 microkelvin so that means if you absorb a photon and scatter this is the heating which will happen but you uh, for bc you want to go to much lower temperature than this uh, so that means this is a limiting factor if you have the photon absorbing and scattering this is the heating and it does not allow it to cool, be cooled even further so you need a da need dark traps where you don't have scattering of photons so as i said in optical tweezers you have the laser beam which is actually forming the dipole trap very very far away from the atomic transition there is no scattering of photons so it's very very far away from the resonance so scattering is almost negligible and also in the magnetic trap of course there is no uh, photons at all so that's why to go to even very low temperature we need to have this dark traps which is the optical tweezers or the magnetic trap to cool down further thank you sanjukta and to commemorate this occasion I'd like to give her a present thank you